Okay. Very happy to be here with you all. I think we might need to say that we, yes. Yes, thank you. Those who know me know I love a good preamble, but given um, a lot of the, the challenges emotionally I've already been holding for folks today in the context of recent news and historic anniversaries, I'm actually gonna give us a moment to settle in and then I'll give you what we could call a post amble and we'll talk about the teachings tonight. But let's give ourselves this gift of really arriving here in this moment Tonight, we've chosen to take refuge in these three beautiful jewels, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Let's really feel and sink into that choice of refuge. Taking refuge in the Buddha is taking refuge in our own awake nature. Already here, always attempting to glimmer through or shine even brightly through obscurations and obstacles. So for a couple moments here, let's focus on that part of us that is always already luminous, wakeful and brilliant. In this choosing of taking refuge in the Buddha, our own awake nature, there's an implicit recognition that our happiness is within. Not that we shouldn't be concerned with the outside world, but that this internal wellspring of joy and goodness is just right there. So as much as possible, without concepts or ideas or some expectation, see if we can relax just a bit more together to the sense of our awakeness.
like a spark illuminating in the night, take refuge in these teachings. These teachings which essentially show us the true nature of reality that help us get free from our difficult, destructive emotions. That simple knowingness of everything changing, everything connected. Well, with a spirit of just remembering these teachings, let's find ourselves in this refuge of the Dharma. As we train our hearts and minds, find those glimmerings of our luminous nature, we can start to see that nothing that happens to us in this life is outside of the Dharma. If we can apply wisdom and compassion to it, even if that feels far away, imagine that possibility of freedom, true refuge in the Dharma, and inviting even one more layer of refuge, a sense of place, belonging. And that's the refuge of Sangha. each of us tending to our own heart, mind, and body, yet connected in this shared aspiration of what we practice for. In your mind's eye, maybe you can recall the faces you saw when we started this evening.
whether you know others in this space well or seeing them for the first time. How wonderful to be in community. Feel the naturalness of that refuge. Our sense of being held and at its essence, a sense of love. for just a bit longer, feel a sense of this body, mind and heart as refuge, holding within it our presence and wakefulness, our insights and clear seeing, our love and ability to be loved. from this place of refuge, as though we had the comfort of a blanket on a cold night. We can attend to our own struggles and difficulties with kindness, curiosity, noticing what might be here in the space tonight emotional residue or acute emotional experiences, fatigue, overwhelm. Welcoming everything into this refuge. Gently, gently making space.
Thank you for practicing together. We will do another practice tonight. That was our, our appetizer, our invitation into the space together. Any reflections or thoughts on that practice of opening to refuge, to our connection here together? Don't think we can see the chat, but you're welcome to raise your hand. Or Diane, if you see the chat, welcome to share it with us. Thank you. All right, I'll start my post amble. <laughs> Welcome to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Really happy that we're all here together. And as many of you, if not all of you know, we are just so fortunate to have a completely volunteer run center. So we support one another. It's really such a beautiful example of Sangha. And, you know, I was thinking about coming together for practice. Like just what a beautiful choice we make when we do that. And it's, you know, so reflected what we want to see in the world or what we want to manifest in the world. We get to practice here. So when I think of the Sarasco Dharma Collective space specifically, um, when we were online, I was often sharing the paramitas as a way for us to enter collective space. And these paramitas or these spiritual qualities, which really support our awakening, just want us to kind of hold them in mind as we're together tonight. Um, when we think of the paramitas, uh, we, we really think of what are the ways that we most want to be with each other and be with ourselves. So we can think of um, our patience, our determination, our generosity, our effort, all of these are just um, so essential. Our wisdom, our discipline, and each of these we think of as we relate to each other. So not just, oh yeah, that's nice. Yeah, patience sounds good, but patience with one another, right? Patience in how we engage as Sangha. And then how we can be, of course, as Mace was talking about, our generosity, but even generous with our listening, generous with our attention. When we are online and, and for our online friends, I said the generosity of giving yourself only this screen, not like your online groceries and the news and you know everything else, you know, really being generous. When we really think about kind of the core ethic of meditation, Buddha Dharma, we're thinking about non-harming. That's the core. And that non-harming is so essential. It's how we speak to ourselves, our own thoughts, self-criticism, and it's how we move through the world, everything we do. It's such a beautiful principle to abide by. So, so important and something I want us to really consider in our shared space together. I am gonna be a little bit of a rebel tonight Yes, we will still get to this book, which we've been working on. And yet, <laughs> it's interesting. Um, these teachings on, on formlessness or emptiness, it's a little hard to dive right in when we're in the midst of such intense suffering. I mean, there is always suffering. There is not a time in which there isn't. But when there's a collective moment where for many of us, it's a real, um, pull of the heart. It makes sense for us to address these, these aspects really of empathy and compassion. And there is a good segue between empathy, uh, empathy, compassion, and emptiness, or being able to release ego clinging. But I'm going to ask us to hang out a little in empathy and compassion on our way in tonight. So that's what we will engage with. 
And I wanted to bring up those paramitas and kind of our agreements in a way of being together, because I would love to hear from folks in the room. I think it's really important when we prime the pump of empathy and compassion to do so with ourselves, with those who are right here, right? Abstractly, I am aware that you are all suffering and there are challenges and difficulties in your life. And yet for our practice to really start to engage and in some ways um, be forged, we have to be able to practice with what's right in front of us. And for many of us, again, that's this anniversary, the murder of George Floyd. That's these two huge killings, uh, mass shootings in the last couple weeks. So we have a lot of raw material right here with us and navigating not only our experience of that, but how that pain radiates for each of us in different ways. So I wanna talk a little bit about empathy and compassion before I invite us to maybe engage in a bit of um, Meaningful sharing, yeah, about where we are and what might be up at this moment. So when we think about empathy and compassion, it makes sense to start with bodhicitta. So we are, when we're thinking about generating bodhicitta, really the essence of all of our meditation, we do this for the sake of all beings. I actually went back and was rereading a book we, we all, uh, covered here together, I guess it was 2020, um, Open Heart, Open Mind by Sokni Rinpoche. And in that book, he just so beautifully describes absolute bodhicitta. And he says that our absolute bodhicitta is we actually see all beings as already woken up. We can see through all of the veils, all of the vitriol, all of the hatred, right, that we at this moment can see a lot of, right, in our polarized society, in our polarized world. But that when we can really see every being as all ready for their qualities of being fully awake, we treat them with ultimate respect. And Sokni writes that when you're in the presence of people who are touching into absolute bodhicitta, what you feel is this incredible kindness, generosity, and patience. So remembering this absolute bodhicitta is this, it's this, it's this place for us to keep in mind that we could have the possibility of being able to see the goodness, the awakeness that's already manifest. And we know it's manifest not only in others, but in us. So in that way, it kind of is free from the dualism. Most of us, we're hanging out in relative bodhicitta, let's be honest, doing our best day to day. And that's dualistic, that's okay. But we are, you know, effortfully dedicating ourselves to sincerely helping all beings to become more free. And, you know, that, it requires actually quite a lot of empathy and a recognition of how people are struggling and suffering. And it also means that we have to be clear on the true causes and conditions of suffering for ourselves and others. So within this relative bodhicitta, we have you know, aspiration bodhicitta that we are dedicating ourselves to others. And then also the ways we actually try and act, enact this every day. We really try to show up and um, give our full loving hearts. So I, I wanna talk a little bit about empathy. I, I think there's often some uh, misunderstandings <coughs> with empathy. Oh, is there a question? Random, okay, no, maybe not. When we think about empathy, we're thinking about um, our ability to immediately resonate emotionally with others. So for many of us, that's reading the news. For many of us, that's you know receiving a text, thinking about someone we care about. And we can 
understand and feel the suffering of another being. Our empathy allows us to do that. Kind of amazing neuroscience on empathy. It's totally mind blowing that they can see the like millisecond difference between resonating kind of in this base emotional way and then thinking or appraising in this more conceptual way. But empathy is the combination of that resonating to the suffering and how we understand it or how we think about it. Now our empathy can really get us in trouble when we take it personally. When because we are seeing and resonating and thinking, it's almost as though it's happening to us. So we get what's called this empathic distress. And we look and it's so understandable, so natural. We look at the suffering in the world. Our heart opens to it and we, we lose ourselves in it. And the overwhelm and the distress of it becomes very personal. So many of you know I've gotten really, truly the privilege to work with healthcare folks um, for many years now. And myself was a social worker down there in the ER at SF General. And not succumbing to that distress is really tough when the being in front of you is suffering and they truly, you know, they are impacting your entire mind, heart and body stream. But the key to kind of transitioning from the empathic distress to the compassion, that's really so interesting. I actually energetically feel it as a leaning back. So when we're empathically engaged, it's we're really essentially kind of merged, right, within the suffering and, and challenge. And the compassion isn't moving back as in, like, get me away from here. It's moving back as in, let me see this more clearly. Like, let me have a bigger view of what's happening so that I can actually wrap that care more fully around really what's happening here. And to wrap your care more fully, you have to understand a lot of the causes and conditions of what leads to that suffering. Doesn't mean you need to know every single detail, but just to know it's greater than what in that moment you are experiencing. And there's a level of trust that our compassion requires of us, that we believe our care has some efficacy. Our compassion can't be just, oh, I think this is the right thing, and maybe this is what a meditation teacher told me to do. Our compassion is we lean back. It's almost like we're leaning back into the pilot seat, right? And we're taking charge, and we are going to completely engage with this practice, this stance of compassion towards others. So I think it's, um, I think it's a really interesting reflection, especially when we're in the midst of a lot of turned up emotions and experiences is feeling that experience of empathy, that feeling of compassion, maybe even noticing the difference between the two and how we hold you know, our tender hearts with both. So I'd love to hear your questions, certainly. I, I would also like us, as I, I kind of suggested, I want us to do a practice of Tonglen or giving and receiving, such a, a beautiful one to do. But I want us to really have a sense of the rawness of one another um, and what might be going on in terms of what might be churned up or feeling emotional. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not inviting uh, us to all fall into despair. I know that might be hard. But I'm asking us to hold ourselves with that compassion. Right, so to be able to kind of lean back and share what is in the heart, what's moving through you, what wants to be heard, what wants to be known. Um, so that's my, my invitation. Excuse me, Eve. Denise um, wrote in the chat that it's so good to be with everyone in the Sangha, you and the Sangha. Thank you, Eve, and everyone who makes this possible is present. And I just wanted to remind folks that tomorrow is the anniversary of the VTA workers getting shot hmm. in San Jose. Oh, thank you. So, yeah. Yep. Thank you. Yes. 
Hi, Eve. It's nice to be here with you. I haven't been able to make it because of the seven o'clock time change, and it's just so nice to be back this evening. Um, I, um, you know, one of the things I'm really, really struggling with right now is um, the sense of feeling very jaded. You know, I mean, our political system right now is such that despite the fact the majority of people in this country want certain gun regulations, we have wealthy lobbyists who just will not allow this to happen. And so in the face of this, I think the hardest thing is not to, I mean, I both feel the pain of what has happened, but then I'm like, if it's this pain that has nowhere to go. Yeah. That, and I, I really am struggling with that. Yes, I, I feel this pain and I send out my empathy or I make my contributions. I do my things and it, you know, this, the waiting, the, you know, <laughs> um, you know, it, it, the hope that someday subsanity will prevail. I, I don't know. It's yeah. very hard. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Despair and rage are both totally uh, called for in these times, you know, those both of those feelings. And I appreciate you didn't name either of those emotions, but just the feeling of how long are we going to wait? You know, we just talked about this paramita of patience, but is this really the time for patience? And I, I think it's it's, you know, in the in the book right now, we're on the chapter of meditation, view and action actions in there and you know one of the most important things is identifying and naming what isn't right and really saying it's this isn't just something that we you know i think mace was at the very beginning suggesting that practicing in community together as andrea is offering tomorrow and and we are doing here practicing in community means that we recognize and that we can kind of motivate ourselves for collective action. It doesn't mean we kind of compassion our way out of caring. It's such a tricky one because, you know, anger especially is such an important motivating emotion for change. We need it. But when we act in our anger, very rarely are we getting what we want. Um, it's so important for us to use that fuel as clear seeing and to use that fuel for us to keep that energy despair and <clears throat> which is really coming from sorrow and sadness god it's so heavy it really can be hard for us to motivate anger is so helpful for the motivation and yet the time scale and when to act and how to act is not always clear and I think it's interesting, you know, you were saying it wasn't, it's not hard to have compassion and send compassion and care, but it probably is pretty hard to have compassion and care for those lobbyists. And not saying, you know, that that's the solution is that we should make okay everyone who harms. But I do think that there's a way that we are not sure when we are going to be called, right? So yeah, also like we can donate our money, we can, look for ways to have our effort support others but there is and will be times when we are going to be directly required to show up with compassion fierce compassion to show up and make changes that are needed to be changed whether that's you know um, protesting in the street whether that's making our voice heard in one way or another like so essential but in the meantime as we like in some ways have to wait our way or find our way to our direct action we have to keep our heart supple and supple means tender to the suffering of the world and strong right a, a, a belief that practicing compassion has efficacy maybe not in this moment but over time um, it's such a tough one it's so unsatisfying i can't remember how many times mace and i have had this conversation over the last years, you know, like, yes, I get I should care about the suffering of people, even who I deem to be, you know, harmful and wrong. 
but they're harmful and wrong. So how do we stop the harmful and wrong? And I think as a, you know, as a collective, it's a good question for us. I'm open for anyone's idea on what we can do. We can write letters, we can donate, we could have a, a sit-in and a protest. I think now is a really good time for thinking of important collective ways that we can show up. The world is really needing it. Lindsay, I see your hand, then Mace, yes. Yeah, thank you, uh, Laura, for what you said and then how you answered that question, Eve. Um, I really appreciated and was feeling so grateful for the Dharma and this Sangha when we when you were walking us through kind of the different senses of the word refuge. And then um, a, a sentence that I think about a lot um, came up to me in this meditation, which is something that Donna Haraway wrote, and she's a philosopher mm -hmm. of science, and she wrote, um, and she's talking about mass extinction, but also about um, the way human and non-humans are tied together and all, of, mm -hmm. you know, the deepest levels. And she said, right now, the world is full of refugees, human and otherwise, with nowhere to take refuge. Mm -hmm. And that line popped into my head as we were meditating. And I just... I, it is so, I think this gap you're talking about with patience and keeping your heart supple, it, I'm just contacting how deeply painful that is because I kept yeah. thinking about how it, it felt so, um, oh, my dog is really snuggling in right now. That's good. <laughs> um, it felt so um, warm to be sort of practicing and like acknowledging my own taking refuge but then i just kept thinking those kids could not have refuge so what a, so the word that kept coming up was but 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 now yeah. now now yeah <clears throat> thank you yeah <laughs> I take refuge in the hope that these are the conditions, like these terrible conditions are the conditions needed for our consciousness to shift. We, our comforts, our relative okayness that we all, some of us manage easier than others has in some ways prevented the urgency you're describing. Um, and it can be, and you know, you know, Laura said right off the bat, like, I'm so jaded of this news cycle and this exact same situation. But I think jaded is truly the thing we have to avoid and keeping it fresh and keeping it poignant and keeping it relevant. Um, so essential. Yeah. Could I, could I just follow up one, one thing, Eve, if I may? Yeah. I think the hard part is just feeling like, does my action matter? That's, that's the jadedness, the sense of I've done this, I've done that. And no matter what <clears throat> I seem to do, and so many amazing people seem to do, it's like we're stuck. And in that, in that case, I, I really think it's a choice of how we look at it. You know, I, I do, right, like our, our physical exercise that we do every day to keep supple in the body, it's easier to see the benefits, right? Um, and we don't think that if we do it once, it'll last. We know we have to do it all the time. And with our practice of compassion and patience, because um, in some ways, patience is really wisdom, right? Because we see that, God, this time span, like, so much more complicated than we know. The things that we lose, the things that are connected, like all of this is kind of unfolding and coming and going and unfolding and coming and going. And we look back and we're, you know, we're like, oh yeah, 10 years ago, can't believe I didn't see it the way I see it now, right? There's this insight, this understanding of a greater span of time that's not so focused on, on us. And it's so tough to have both urgency and patience, but I think that's it. 
right? We're holding it in both hands. Like this absolutely has to change. There's nothing okay. And I don't know how it's gonna change, but it has to, it, like, I could almost think of patience as a, as a flexibility of just not knowing quite how it needs to change and being, because patience often feels like waiting, but I really think of patience as like a dynamic flexibility. Like I am flexible to how this happens. And I will as ever quote, you know, Pema Chodron who is highlighting the Lojong for us that we have to do our compassionate action and give up all hope of fruition. Not give up hope, but that fruition of how. And yeah, such a, such a, so, such an amazing, uh, it's like a high intensity interval training, right? That <laughs> holding the fullness of our urgency and the fullness of our flexibility, our wisdom, our compassion together. Yeah. I see Jim's hand and I know Mace also is. Okay, Jim, please. The time is now. Stop the waiting. Get on these politicians. I've made it vow to myself i'm calling them every day maybe every mm. hour i want to march on washington i want to march on the capitol because this is just not acceptable mm. and and the, the the same voices are coming up already mental health we don't have a problem with guns it's just like wait a minute <laughs> isn't this a democracy it's just, yeah, I, I'm, I'm done waiting. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's time. I, I would go to Washington tomorrow. It's Amazing. time. It's time. Because these people are so ingrained, uh, you know, and I want to, I want to bring charges against the NRA as a terrorist organization. Hmm. You know, things like that, because you know, as these clowns are having their meeting in the next couple of days, the NRA meeting, I mean, it's just like, what? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we can't, we can't converse with them. We can't meet them on these weird ways. We just have to say no. And if that involves physical restraint, I don't know, but it's just enough. <laughs> That's all I have to say. And yeah. I encourage you all to just Email Mitch McConnell, email your senators, email everybody and do it over and over and over and put Mitch McConnell's words back to him like words fail me. It's like, yeah, yeah, enough words. <laughs> you know, like they're all very well versed in hand wringing. My hands are getting sore. They're really chapped. So let's do it. Yeah. Thanks for sharing your. Thank you enthusiasm and you know and i think it's it's great to have that sense of clarity and you know i think the the frustration that can allow it is like i said a powerful energy and i think it is still like an unbelievable exercise routine for us to be both that clear that emphatic and love you know knowing sure, what, it's it's what greater love than to change this yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's again, it's uh, we will uh, I hope I hope you do and we'll make it to Washington as soon as possible. And and, you know, be <laughs> for us join me. A way to, yeah. You know, everyone's got their circumstances. Right. Sure. And sure. their and their um, their there are ways that they can be involved. But what I'm really appreciating is just the clarity, the determination, and, you know, especially if it can be held in love and in bodhicitta. Um, I think that's really, it can be very slippery to not um, create the duality of right and wrong. And though we can fight against what is harmful, right, with that core ethic of non-harming, it's unbelievable to, at that same moment, just imagine that absolute bodhicitta of seeing the goodness in everyone. So that's an, it's a, a beautiful one to bring to Washington. <laughs> Indeed. 
Yeah. Mace, your patience is incredible. <laughs> okay. Um, Can you all hear okay? Not at all. Okay, I, I, will, I, I will do my best. No problem. Uh, it would be nice if she could get close to the mic or something because we can yeah. really understand what yeah. she was saying. Yeah. No, Thank but I, I will, I will, sh I will um, I'll, I'll recount. And well, first of all, um, she, it, like right when the meditation started, there was an alert that her hometown is on fire and that people she knows are, you know, in danger, right? Which is, we haven't named climate catastrophe tonight, but we will bring it into our sphere of concern and care. And, you know, the reality is, of course, there's things we can do, just just like Jim is saying, with, with the climate as well. But I do think a lot of our training right now, period, is in not, is in being with distress, to be honest, because there's going to be so many different things we need to do at so many different times. And we, it's interesting because I think when I think of distress or distress tolerance, it truly is emotion awareness. And we have to know what we're feeling. We have to know why we're feeling it. And then we have to know our own like toolbox of strategies that work for us. And then we can return to our empathy and compassion. But if we are, you know, blown up in a way with our distress, which is very natural. These are real things to be distressed about. These are not abstract. They're ongoing and they compound, right? It's if we aren't sleeping well, because, you know, we're having a heat wave in May in San Francisco, and there's mosquitoes at night 
and then you know the rest of the country is burning and there's violence. like these things compound it can become overwhelming that distress becomes overwhelming so quick quickly mace was also describing you know the challenge of being in public education and how the kids feel abandoned i will say i did when you said that and i am thinking not of fixing but of solutions and i was like well can we tutor them you know, can we as a collective find our way to offering a tutoring some way? So Mace was calling like anyone who wants to be in education, we need are needed right now. Um, and I think that there is, I think that there are um, ways we can show up. And I remember there was the food bank last year that you were, you know, recruiting for and that, you know, our Sangha members working in front lines in various ways can offer us opportunities of how to help. And that's really valuable. Um, and it is, you know, my teacher, Jennifer Wellwood, uh, often tells us, she says, this world right now doesn't need more despair. It needs more capacitated bodhisattvas. And that works for me. That is a lot like the, you know, Shanti Deva teaching on how do we be with our anger. And Shanti Deva instructs us, you know, recognize the scope. So many other things, whatever your anger is, there's so many other things to be angry about. There's so much out there. So try to put your anger in perspective. And then he also recommends that we recognize complexity. How many causes and conditions led to this? Right now I'm angry at this one congressman, but oh my gosh, years systems histories ancestries of this like there's so much like try to not because our, our anger narrows and focuses us which can be good and it can be deceiving but then the last piece of advice that i love so much is let your feeling of anger overwhelming anger be your training ground because there's going to be no <laughs> there's going to be no shortage on things to be angry about you could say the exact same for your despair Whatever you feel despairing of, recognize the scope, the complexity, and recognize it as a training, right? We have to keep our hearts open. It's, it's really tough what this world is, is asking um, and will continue to ask of us. And some folks, myself among them, you know, think we're probably living in the best of times that we have, and things may just continue to erode in this lifetime for us. And that we have this relative fortune right now to be practicing together and strengthening and learning. This is good. This is important, right? And it may not feel like we're doing enough, but it's this is going to come in handy. These trainings, this connection, community, ways of being together. So, Steve, yeah. there's a couple of chats. That, okay. Yeah, read them. So Jim just wrote that he left us. I just left education. He's retiring tomorrow. And someone identified as I says, I've given up just too abusive, too injurious to my health. I just had to stop. With education. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Mace is the great Bodhisattva, one of many in the public education system. And I do think, you know, having that sense of confidence, right? That we are doing the work, we are showing up instead of what should we be doing and how we should be showing up. So it's just a different way of being with our experience. Yeah. Um, Nate's also said something about thinking about the people who did the shooting. Right. And, and their lack of their lack of sangha, their lack of support, and, and other difficult people out in the world. Yeah. You know, I uh, was talking to a spiritual friend this morning about this topic, and we were talking about how our interactions with other people in the world every day do make a difference. That if we can be there for someone, I mean, all those people who, all those, you know, bad people, they did not get some support at some point. Yeah. They that could have helped them not be so whatever it is they are. Yeah. And, and we can provide that to people we interact with. Yeah. It's 
not a, it's not useless, it's not meaningless. Yep. Yep. Did you all hear that? No. Okay. <laughs> so Noam was, um, Noam was sharing another part of what May said is that these young men, these angry young men, or, you know, in the case of George Floyd, this police officer, right? They lacked some amount of, God, it was so beautiful. I remember that, you know, they say the defense was trying to say that George Floyd's heart was enlarged and that's what, that's why he died. And in the verdict, it said that the heart of the police officer wasn't big enough. That was the difference. And I, you know, so the training that is needed for our frontline providers, the training that is needed or Sangha that is needed for alienated young men seeking these explosive and violent um, ways of probably, you know, for them, that, right, they have a Sangha. And their Sangha is one in which just like us, they're trying to be at peace and at ease, right? And it's, and one thing Noam highlighted is the little interactions we have every day really matter. The kindness that we can impart on others, that we can feel, that we can generate, and it's true. And it's gonna get, it's hard. <laughs> it's really hard to stay kind and to stay open. Yeah. Claudia wrote in the chat, Eve, thanks for reminding us that we can find happiness within us and also our own luminosity when we seek refuge, which will help us build resilience when needed in the real world. Yes. Amen. Yeah, no, it is, right? And it is, again, that interesting. It's so tricky because if we focus too much on that inner refuge, we can get ourselves real close to spiritual bypass and not take action. So I promised that I'd bring us around to the book. So I'm gonna attempt. Um, a lot of what was described in this chapter on the view is, is really about how we see and hold phenomena, the nature of our mind, our thoughts, um, everything that arises in our mind, the external things in our environment, our emotions and our actions. And what's so interesting is for us to really, you know, get on board, of course, with absolute bodhicitta, but also to be able to have the kind of compassion that isn't so self-referential, the kind of empathy that isn't personally distressing. We actually have to really help ourselves see all this phenomena and nature of mind as empty, unborn, ungraspable, the non-dwelling absolute, the empty, the luminous. So it's not that these practices of these nature of mind practices are irrelevant for our em empathy and compassion. Actually, they're an essential ingredient. So interesting because <clears throat> conceptually for years, I've been really struggling with this concept that out of emptiness comes our compassion. I'm like, wait, what? What do you mean out of emptiness? And it's, um, I remember Pamela sharing, I don't know, maybe a month back now, this understanding or elaboration of emptiness as really fullness, an ability to see the dynamic exchange and interplay of things coming and going. And when we can really see that, our compassion can be so much clearer instead of singularly laser pointed, focused and targeted on something in this moment or feeling compassion for something because it hurts us. But a compassion that really has that wisdom, um, I do think there's, yeah, it's such an interesting dynamic interplay, training our mind in this ability to really find this sense of luminosity, right? The sense of clarity and that not as a way to avoid or deny compassion. So I'm gonna read um, just two here. This one is kind of about the interplay of view, meditation, and action. It's on page 196 for those who are looking. It is essential to put into practice the view, action, and meditation together because they are interdependent, like a stack of spears leaning against each other. Without the view, however good your actions may be, 
They will involve a brief, a belief in reality and perpetuate samsara. That's such a good one for us, right? We wanna take action, but if we are taking action without the view, however good your actions may be, they'll involve a belief in reality and perpetuate samsara. So here we are busy trying to tear something down or prevent, but because we aren't really seeing how things are shifting and changing, we may just end up perpetuating samsara. And, and one way I could see that happening is feeling super frustrated and disappointed when things aren't happening quick enough, right? Like here we are taking action, but our demand and desire that they happen soon can perpetuate samsara. The view without action will not complete the acquisition of merit and can lead one into the abyss of nihilism. So maybe you have a really clear view, but you're not enacting it. You're not doing anything. You're not actually being of service. You're not helping liberate beings. So you end up in a nihilism or a bypass. Bypass wasn't a word, I think, when this was written. View and action without meditation are as useless as a treasure buried underground. Just as an inexhaustible treasure hidden under the hut of a poor man will not prevent him from being hungry. Although the view and action may have been explained at great length without the practice of meditation, they will not enable the mind to mix with the Dharma. In the hour of need, they will hardly be useful. So even if we have this understanding and even if we're taking action, the meditation is what restores us. It refreshes us, allows us to show up every day and do this work. I'll just play, I'll just uh, play, no, um, say, <laughs> we can play, uh, just say one more here, which I think it's, you know, um, Gosh, there's a lot of juicy ones, but I'll, I'll just save, save some of them. Hmm. All phenomena arise from emptiness through the illusory play of causes and conditions. It is precisely their empty nature that allows them to manifest. Just as space enables the totality of the universe to unfold, without itself being altered or affected in any way, or just as the sky makes possible the appearance of a rainbow. Phenomena are the adornment of emptiness, but emptiness is never tainted by them. So again, it could be very easy to say, how is that relevant to the suffering today? How is that gonna help change anything? All of these are really ways that we're training our heart and mind to see clearly training ourselves for that kind of inexhaustible resource of compassion. So I wanted to do another practice, but before I do so, questions, protests, reflections, Pamela. Yes. All phenomena arise from emptiness through the illusory play of causes and conditions. And it's precisely their empty nature that allows all things to manifest. Just as space enables the totality of the universe to unfold without itself being altered or affected in any way. Just as the sky makes possible the appearance of a rainbow. Phenomena are the adornment of emptiness, but emptiness is never tainted by them. How does that land for you? Yeah. You, for me, at least. You, yes. Claudia. Claudia. Well, I, ever since we've been touching on this view, meditate, action section of the book, I've been really wrestling with view. And I'm just wondering if at the personal level, is it, is it trying to, as you had mentioned before, the view is like seeing our, our obscurations or our, our misperceptions, if you want, and trying to transform them. Or I, I, it's not quite that clear to me. I, I really like to understand it. I mean, I, I 
meditate and I try to get to the point without forcing it, of course, but of the yeah. setting the mind in, the, in, in its natural state and stuff like that. But I, I'm just wondering, what exactly do they mean by view, meditate? I don't know if I make myself understood, but I, I just... Yeah. I just don't quite understand what is the per the per is is the purpose kind of like the processing of these obscurations, the trying to see more clearly by being more open to our subconscious. I, I, I you're you're almost there. You're giving us at least three quarters, so you're definitely on the right track. So you mentioned you know seeing our obscurations. Uh -huh. And and I think if you elaborated that just a bit further, you're capturing a lot. Well, I'm I'm talking. I'm, I guess I'm thinking in terms of emotions. Like we have yeah. worked with you, you know, like maybe seeing um, by obscurations, I mean destructive emotions, resentment, anger, uh, jealousy, uh, yeah. uh, not forgiving, and and maybe trying to see where is this coming from yes what is triggering it where yes. is my conditioning and so if i open my heart and if i tap more into my subconscious can i somehow then develop that empathy that compassion and mm -hmm. that's where the transformation would be of my of of becoming a better human being and yeah. for my own sake and for others. But is that it? So the, the, there's a slight ingredient that okay. would really catalyze everything you said. Everything you said is exactly accurate. And then the other piece is really pointing us towards releasing our self-centered views. And so even though working with our emotions is essential, mm -hmm. it can reinforce a self-centered view, right? It's my experiences and, and my past and my history. And so with the view, we're also sprinkling in this recognition that myself, all my thoughts, everything I get triggered about, all of that is kind of coming and going. It's right. not the way I see it, which is that's there and this is me and there's this dynamic thing that's happening and my emotions are rising and in the past this other thing happened to me and that's why now I'm like this. Even though that knowing those patterns is so important to help loosen them, uh -huh. to truly transform them, the view is the one in which we can recognize just these things are just um, not as fixed and solid. Right. Both how we see ourselves, our own history, how we see others. So that I, you know, this is why there's this flowery language, like everything is primordially pure. You know, it's, everything's like a lake, it's limpid and clear. And this idea that, you know, there's a part of our consciousness there's a, that is primordially pure. And that that's true for all of us. And that actually it's not separate. It's beautiful, it's poetry, it's hard to feel, right? It's not as, as tangible as kind of unpacking a single emotion episode. Mm -hmm. But I think when we unpack our emotions and we unpack events, we start to see that it's almost like, um, it's like being able to see, you know, when there's a movie projected on the screen, it looks like it's just happening. But then your finger gets in front of it and you see, oh my gosh, it's projected on my hand. It's not actually happening there. It's like that seeing of, wow, this way I see the world. No, oh, it's a projection. Uh, so I that's love, when uh, the, Go ahead, go ahead, no. Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, that, I mean, that's when I think we get that, like it, and it kind of like, I'm sure you felt it. it. It like lights you up of like, oh, oh, and it's a relief. Yeah. Yeah. And I love how they talk about how our thoughts and our emotions, I mean, it's, they're not fixed. They're not, I mean, they're constantly changing. And, and I think there was a metaphor, something about the minute you drop something in the water, it kind of disappears. And that yeah. it shouldn't be like our thoughts and all these shouldn't be like ice that is so rigid and solid, but rather like water that is flowing. It's beautiful. You, you're right. It's so poetic. 
It is, but it's hard to feel sometimes, you know? So I'm really glad you asked that question because I think it's, we almost have to just notice it when it appears for us. And it, and it happens, you know, when we're not trying so hard often. Thank you. It's really hard while we're meditating. You're like, <laughs> what do you mean spacious mind, <laughs> right? It's so abstract. So yeah, thank you for that question. Thank you. Other questions or thoughts before we do a, a closing practice together? I'll, I'll share this one for you, Claudia. I love it. There's one more on the view here. What appears to our perception when we look into its nature for something identifiable is non-existent. Non-existent though it is, it gives rise to the experience of all happiness and suffering. Just that amazing paradox, you know? Yeah, it's non-existent and completely relevant to my everyday well-being. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. Yeah. Thoughts, reflections, questions, protests, inspirations. So we have a call to go to Washington that Jim will lead us. We have maybe an opportunity to tutor some kids. Yeah, the gray tortoise will leave tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> Be there. <laughs> DeBose and Misha. Or, or anyone else just wanting to share a bit about how the world is touching their heart right now as we head into our kind of compassion Tonglen practice. Really helpful to have that tenderizing. Yes. Um, yeah, I went to the um, Microphone, please. We can't hear. Sure, if you don't mind. Will that work? No? Okay. Hello. <laughs> like a rock star. Now. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, Appreciated Eve naming the empathetic distress. Um, and something that's been helping me is being aware of like multiple realities that are going on inside of me at one time, mm. where like there's the part of me that wants to like vomit and like curl up in a ball and like say no and like really just fall apart, you yeah. know? And then there's also the part of me that I've like thankfully been able to cultivate with meditation and presence that is like tender mm. and strong mm. and like can coincide with holding that part of me that just wants to cry hysterically. Yeah. And that like that balance right mm. now, like between those two is like the way that I like, I'm trying <laughs> to like walk into hospital rooms, yeah. you know? and when I'm in empathetic distress and completely taking in everybody that I'm encountering, I'm not present for them yeah, at all. Right, the irony of that. Yeah, like I'm not present for them at all. Like there's this patient that I've been really spinning about and I can't even walk into a room right now because I feel for her so much. And that's not what I'm there to do. <laughs> I'm there to like offer her support in what she's going through and um, so yeah, anyway, I just really mm. appreciate you naming that. And I would love to talk to you about hospital work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for lifting that up. I think it's so interesting. You know, the distress is obviously a sign of our care, but it prevents us from being available for care. Because if we're so caught up in that distress, we really, we can't accurately attune to others. So there's... Like, yeah, somewhat a motivation, especially for those of us working in frontline situations, just that reminder, like, hey, like this, in order for me to do what I'm here to do, I have to, you know, like, like that lean back into mm -hmm. compassion. Mm -hmm. Not suppressed and I avoid. I mean, that temporarily can help. Mm -hmm. um, but to find that other kind of posture in a way, that other move. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that would be great if you don't mind. Hi. Um, so I was the one 
talking to you last week. Um, and I work with a community-based program that does healing in prisons. And I have also been experiencing extreme <laughs> burnout and empathetic distress. But in my case, it's a little bit different. I have lots of energy to be with people, but we cannot actually access the people mm. because of COVID. And, you know, COVID became kind of a brilliant excuse right. for the Department of Corrections to just shut everything yeah. down and make everything hard. So that sense of just kind of beating my head against the wall, that is for me where the burnout is coming from. Yeah. It's not about being with people. If yeah. I could go in and I could be inside with people, I'd be cool with that. Yeah. But um, so I just want to name that. And yeah. it's, it's, you know, it's very real and it's, it's, you know, and I'm sure it's the same thing for people in education. It's yeah. very, very hard to work within these spaces. And I think, I think we have to be able to acknowledge that as well. I yeah. mean, the, the system is broken and very dehumanizing. And yeah. By design, it's encouraging people to leave. I mean, and that's what happens in the prison yeah. is that people just, they're just like, I, I can't get in, I can't get in to do the work. And at a certain point, they're just like, okay, fine. I, you know, I'm putting my flag up. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for naming that. Um, and I think you're pointing out actually something we see so clearly in the burnout literature, which is there's the emotional exhaustion, right? That emotional labor, often, especially when patients or clients or whomever there's a resonance that's a little deeper, right? For whatever reason, they look like your aunt or they, you know, remind you, like there's sometimes this just karmic relationship, but there's another part of burnout, um, you know, that's an actual area of research and study on the subscale, which is lack of efficacy. What I do doesn't matter. Oh boy, very different feel, but also a very huge part of burnout. And then the third part is cynicism. And it's interesting, I used to think that you, it was, a, it was like linear exhaustion, lack of meaning, cynicism. But you see people in hospital settings, especially, who are both <laughs> completely exhausted, feel cynical, but there's enough meaning that keeps them in there. And so you're describing almost like it's like the crisis of meaning, like, well, I'm not doing what needs to be done. And actually, it's not set up for me to do what is done. And that is like an incredibly, as you're describing, like exasperating, exhausting source of burnout. And when I've worked with folks who are struggling in that arena, it's unsatisfying, but it's like, what is it like, even if it's like writing to that same person who's shutting you down, like, is there a meaning you can place on that email? or meaning you can place on reaching out to the people and trying to keep them interested as you're waiting to get back in. Because when we feel no meaning, no purpose, that shut down, you're exactly right. You know, it's almost too much. So that meaning is such a protective factor. It's like a, a buffering for stress. So, yeah. And sometimes that's just for us, right? Sometimes the only thing we can find meaning is how am I tending to myself today well enough that I can do this tomorrow. Yeah, thank you. Oof, loving the tenderness in this room I and virtual room. So let's, you know, don't need to really do anything fancy, but let's really tune into what's happening in the mind and the heart and the body. and noticing what might be kind of touched or stirred right now. I'm noticing actually even kind of a, a tenseness in my jaw and in my throat, just how hard it is to give voice to and name and be with a lot of these different forms of struggling and suffering, the uncertainty, the grief. And if it feels comfortable placing a palm on the heart, maybe on the belly, just initiating a sense of compassionate contact with ourselves.
remembering this body, heart, and mind as a body, heart, and mind that holds refuge, that is refuge. And we'll use our breath to do just a simple practice of Tonglen, starting with ourselves. So imagining <clears throat> the challenges and difficulties we may be holding and imagining them visually as like a little pool of smoke in front of the belly, giving them that visual space so that we can focus our attention there. And imagine that we are pouring out a little bit of our own difficulty. We're leaving a little of our own burden by having it manifest right there. And then focusing on this quality, this primordial quality, this indelible quality of our love, our care, our compassion. And no matter how many times we have felt challenged or heartbroken, amazingly, the heart shows up again and again and again. Imagining that as a sphere of light in front of our heart. Like it was a bright sun just cutting through that smoke or haze or fog, anything that could come in front of it. With our inhale, imagining that little cloud of smoke, drawing into that radiant light at the heart, Exhale, may I be free, may I know peace and ease. Inhale, drawing in with that heartfelt aspiration. Exhale, extending compassion, radiating compassion, melting with compassion. Just a couple more on the rhythm of your own breath drawing in and inviting this transformation, some of your own worries and struggles, grievances and grief, loss, pain, and radiating with that clear light, that intrinsic okayness and goodness. emptying out that little cloud and then allowing ourselves to imagine something that's stirring our heart. Maybe it's someone we're working with directly. Maybe we imagine the parents or loved one of folks in the news. And again, imagining this suffering and us being able to relieve some of the burden by pouring out into just a little cloud of smoke. Little but dense. Just symbolizing this weight, this loss or grief or pain. And again, feeling that power of the heart. That radiance of the heart. With this person or persons in mind, we inhale. Bringing forth this material of difficulty to then radiate and cut through at the heart. Exhaling, may you be free. May you be at peace. Inhaling in, 
And extending compassion out. Allowing yourself to fully feel what might be constriction on the inhale, inviting in. And then to fully feel that release and that radiance and openness through the exhale. And extending our next exhale to all beings. Maybe imagining that all beings could know peace and ease. All beings could feel safe and loved. And then releasing the visualizations, releasing our hands that they've been touching the heart and belly. And resting once again in the simple refuge of our body, heart and mind for a couple breaths. Very grateful to be with you all this evening. Thank you. Be kind to yourself. Be good. Be sweet. Enjoy what can be enjoyed. Mm -hmm.